Thomas. Good morning, everybody. So this is about manage, uh, you know, making the most of events. Um, my name is Bruce Thompson. I have uh, been using Civi CRM for about three years now, and we primarily got uh, involved with the project because of uh, all our clients using uh, the event module. So we've been doing a lot of events over those three years and learned a lot, and uh, hopefully I can share some tips and tricks for you. Um, how many people out there are, would consider yourselves users? Okay, good. Um, any implementers type and developers? Okay. Uh, bingo. So like I said, we do, we've done a lot of events and this is really geared to trying to get the most out of your event without doing a lot of extra work. Civi CRM has great event tools um, and you can do a lot without having to do a lot of coding or anything. Um, so I'm going to go through, um, a lot of this is really geared toward uh, planning and then working with the system, working your plan into the system. Um, okay, so events are a key aspect of every organization. Um, everybody, I assume, if you're here, you're going to do some sort of event. And they can be simple events such as fundraisers or dinners, or they could be complex events like multi-day conferences and stuff. Um, and Civi CRM has all these great tools, as I mentioned, to, to handle it. Um, planning uh, ahead of time to optimize the features is going to make your life very easy on what I call game day. If you have a plan that you've been set in stone with and you want to try to make Civi work to that plan, well, you, you probably can do it, but you're probably going to have a lot more work. So if you're moving to a new system, it's always a good idea to look at how you're doing things and maybe change things. It's always a, time, a good time to change when you're moving to a new system. Okay, so events should be organized. Uh, they should be profitable. Now when I say profitable, that doesn't necessarily mean they're making money. You may have a conference that is uh, funded by somebody and profitable means you're utilizing the tools or utilizing the funds correctly and getting the most out of the conference. Or it's a fundraiser, which is a profitable thing. A lot of us do fundraisers. Uh, and they should be fun. I mean, events is when you get out with your people and they should be fun. And, if all those things are working right, you should be in good shape. Uh, they should not be frustrating. Um, they should not be, you don't want to lose money. Um, and chaotic is the worst. <laughs> okay, so a lot of it gets down to planning. When you're going to do a new event, um, you want to plan. Now let me just get an idea here of the kind of events people are doing. Who does a fundraiser, such as a dinner, silent auction, road race, something like that. And then uh, how about workshops, classes, stuff like that? Okay. And then what about conferences? Uh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, and one thing to really consider, is this a regular event? Is this something you're going to do on a monthly basis? Is it something you're going to do once a year? Is it something you're going to do once a quarter? Um, is it something you're not quite sure the schedule, but you're going to do it somewhat regularly? If that's the case, you really want to create a template um, because you can basically start with a bunch of stuff already populated. Um, what I found with a lot of our clients, a lot of our clients say, you know, do two or three events a year. They're pretty major and they're the same every year. So a lot of them will have a template, but some will just copy the previous year. But the key is the first year when they plan everything correctly, the event goes off, they get done, they make some changes. The following years, it may have taken four or five hours to organize or a day or two to organize a plan. The next year, it's down to, when you're set up, goes down to you know, a half hour because you're basically just changing details. Um, so you want to think about promotion. Obviously, you want to promote your event. So mailings, how you're going to, you know, promotional plan. Um, and if it's a paid event, and uh, I assume most of you do some sort of paid events. Uh, uh, so you do want to consider how payments are going to be received. You're going to, what? What credit card processing are you going to use, if any? Are you going to take pro uh, payments offline? And how those instructions are going to work? Uh, and what things are going to cost? And costs, I mean, some events are very simple. It's 50 bucks or, you know, 40 bucks if you register early. Some there's, uh, we have a couple where there's 10 different price points, depending on what days people are attending, what meals they're attending. Um, and planning that ahead of time can get, you know, can really help making sure you get uh, all, the, all the money you need. And then you got to look at who's going to manage your event from a 
back-end standpoint? Who in the office? Do you have volunteers? Um, is it a, a, a paid employee? What are they going to have access to? Uh, in some scenarios, we have people who just want to see reports. We have people who are allowed to edit. We have people who are allowed to make, you know, have full access. Um, you have issues where you're receiving payments um, or registrations offline. You're going to have people have to enter those. And they got to record the payments and edit registrations when people change their minds. Or they said, I registered John Smith, but I'm actually sending um, Sam Jones. Uh, so those are all things uh, you want to consider. Um, and you also, part of costs, this will come up a lot later, is discounts. <coughs> you, know, you really want to think ahead of time about discounts. And there's a lot of ways to do discounts within CIVI CRM. Uh, but discounts are, uh, you know, early bird discounts are great to get people in, and, and then there's other ways. And there's also special discounts, which you will want to consider, because there is, um, this person's a board member, we're going to give them half price. You know, give them a code, but is there a way to just, or a special discount, or we're knocking 20 bucks off because, you know, he washed my car last week. Um. All right, so I always say, and I, I've, so you know my history, I've been working with databases for about 20 years. Um, I started with uh, FileMaker Pro back in the 90s. I spent a lot of years with Access. That's where all the gray hair came from. Um, then I've done a lot of online. Um, before I used Civi CRM, I was building registration systems for people um, with a PHP, my, writing my own system. So the one thing I've always worked when I work with clients is I go, let's look at what you want to get out of your system before we even look at anything else. Because if what you want to get out really is going to dictate what, how it's all going to go in. So when you're looking at your event, you really want to say, OK, when I'm sitting down at that table or whatever, when people are coming in, what do I want in front of me? You know, what, what let printouts, what information, what do I need to know? What do I need to know before I go to the hotel? How many meals do I need? How many uh, you know, special requests do I have? Do I need a, you know, wheelchair access? All these other things that, that come up. If you're booking rooms for people or if they're um, it's included in the package. You want to, you know, do you need accessible rooms? Do you need, uh, we have clients that need uh, ADA requests, whether you need uh, visual aids or hearing aids and stuff like that. So uh, that all comes up is, is, you know, what do you need? And you really want to get a handle on that. You want to know what information is required. Uh, you know, what do you require and what are you going to make required? And you want to make sure you capture those required stuff. Don't go overboard because it can frustrate people, but you want to make sure all that required information is you know attached ahead of time. Uh, as I said, attendance lists and uh, how they're laid out, what the person at the front door is going to have, what the person the hotel is going to have, etc. Um, as a custom information, meals requests, etc. And name badges. What do you want your name badges to look like? You know, I mean, most name badges are pretty simple, but some people I've had clients who want to list uh, what workshop people register for, um, or uh, various different things. So think about name badges ahead of time. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So after you uh, um, plan your event, you really the biggest key is you know you got to get your information in. Someone answer that? I guess not. Okay. They must really want to. All right. Uh, so when you when you get to your registration screens, um, this is where your people are going to put the information in. So they really have to be sensible. They now some screens, city, out of the box, the way the profiles it lays out the, the screens get pretty long. Um, depending on how much information you have, but you really want to keep it as sensible as uh, possible. You don't want user errors. You don't want them typing stuff in the wrong place. Um, so you want to make sure they have you know, instructions and everything. You want to collect all the personal information and set up your profiles correctly, and then you want all your pricing information to be logical and make sense. Um, and then uh, obviously discounts and other things, which I'll go into a little more later. And then also your confirmation messages. Um, what they're going to get when they're done. What instructions do they have? What uh, you know, details about the venue, all that stuff, how it lays out. Um, 
And uh, reminders, uh, Civi does a great job with its scheduled reminders. Are you gonna send out reminders? You know, when are you gonna send them out? You know, how are they all gonna think? Um, as you're setting everything up, you really wanna think about all these things. Okay, um, a little bit. Let me ask, how many people have set up events in Civi before? Okay, pretty much everybody. So pretty much, um, I'm gonna assume everyone's familiar with uh, some of these. Terms. Um, I assume everyone's set up profiles at some point or another. Um, and how much have people used custom fields? Okay, not as much. Um, all right, so when you're setting up a profile, like I said, range fields in a logical order. Uh, you don't wanna have their name, you know, their, their last name, uh, then their address and all that, then their job title. That kind of confuses people. <laughs> uh, so you wanna um, have a logical order of things. Uh, we had one recently where we had to, everyone had to select a county. Well, <laughs> so you know, if you use the little, and populate the county table, if you uh, select the state after the county, <coughs> um, that county table is gonna populate not based on the state. Um, now, in this scenario, it was, they kind of wanted the county higher on the list. Uh, we kind of worked around that, but that's one thing that, you know, it's something we stumbled across. You populate, you hit the state, all of a sudden the right county's dropping. Um, so things like, you know, if, if it's gonna do that, and again, this is, I'm talking out of the box, you can probably write some stuff to fix that. Um, uh, make sure your required fields are logical. It's very frustrating for people um, when they go to register for something, they keep getting error that I haven't hit this required field. And like, let's say you make the job title required and they don't have a job title, um, or there's some other, uh, if you might have a custom field that you need to put something in and you didn't put a selection that says none or something like that. Um, so you, don't, you wanna avoid frustration when people are registering. Gather all your information, but you know, not too much. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the hardest thing is when they're going through and they're entering all this stuff and you've, they've gotta answer 10 more questions about themselves, do you really need all that? You know, can you do it in one field instead of two? Um, you know, if you do need it, if it's a certain thing, then, then by all means do it, but try to make it so that you're not overwhelming people. You gotta remember that most people in, in here, are, you're pretty computer savvy, but we've had, we have organizations where we have people who are not, especially if they're a senior organization. The, the people, they get very frustrated quickly um, and you just wanna stay away from that. Uh, clear instructions and layout. Um, I would say, you know, you, you really can't, it's hard not to tell people too much. Um, you know, you have a spot on top where you can make clear instructions. When you're laying out a profile, each field, you know, you can put in a little instruction <coughs> note, um, which, uh, you know, something like please check all that apply, or tell us about your special needs, or anything like that. Um, and I try to, you know, utilize that as much as possible, because when people are going down, if they're not sure, if there's a little note there, it's gonna save a phone call, it's gonna save frustration, and get you the accurate information. Um, and uh, how many people here have used uh, multi registering multiple people at once? Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know how that works, you, there's a drop down uh, box on top. You can select, I wanna register five people. Uh, the primary person puts in their information. It takes them to the next screen. You put in the next person and the next person after that. Totals it all up as one bill. So if each person's 50 bucks, you register five people. The final checkout is $250. The issue is all the sub, you can put a different template in for all the uh, sub registration. So if the first person you want name, address, and all that, but the next part you just need name and email address, it can make it much faster for the end user. Um, one issue I'll, I'll let you know is if people are using these multiple registrations and you have a pretty big registration system with a lot of things, it's gonna, and this depends on your server environment, but if you don't have a lot of RAM, it's gonna sit there and for a little bit. <laughs> it's gonna have a blank screen, it's gonna sit there while it processes all the information. Um, and uh, I've had some people who've had been on a server that doesn't, isn't cranking out stuff, they're trying to register 10 people for something, and it just sits there blank, and then they hit their back button or something happens and the whole thing gets messed up. Again, it's frustration. So when you use the multiple registrations, um, you know, think about how many people are, are registering, how much input's going through. 
Uh, and also, there's a couple things you should know is when it does this, it creates registrations for everybody. It creates one contribution record for the main person. So when you're receiving payments and you have partial, they pay for two people, it, it gets a little complex. Um, yes? Do you need individual emails for each of the multiple registrants? You don't. Or just no. Each of the first, each of the just the, you can keep, leave that out or you can use the same one. There's a box on the setup and I'll bring up the setup thing in a bit. Um, so, but uh, you know, there are some different things when the multiple registration. I, oh, go ahead. Um, so if you have, can, can you set it up so that you can set up multiple registrations, but they don't have to, so, okay, I need to use an example. So it's <coughs> always ten tickets to an event. Yeah. And they know four of the people, when they register, four of the people that are coming with them. Okay. Not necessarily the other six. Yep. Can you set it up so that they don't have to then go in and actually register ten people? Or um, put in ten names, you know? You can you can opt to skip those, but I think it may change the pricing. Um, there is an option where they can buy like a table of ten, um, which is a, a what it does. They'll register to buy a table, uh -huh. and it'll actually count eight attendees or something, whatever. The, and that's in the setup. Yeah. Um, so if you're selling like a table at a fundraiser, they can say I'm buying. I'm buying 10. Um, my, my concern yeah. is trying to capture those names of the people that if, The other thing you could do, and I'll talk a bit about this when, when, when the next screen we come up, price sets, is you could set up you know, a person where you can buy a number field and you can buy five tickets. And Joe Smith's buying five tickets. Um, well, the, and that's what we do, but yeah. as far as be, if they know who they're bringing to be able to capture those names, that's the issue. Yeah, uh, the, I mean, the multiple registration would be the best way to go. You could put instructions that if you don't know the you know three or four people to just put you know just plus one or something like that so you could um, yeah so it'll create those records um, yes I have a suggestion on that what we do if they're buying a table is rather than requiring them to list the names then for the table participants we um, add a place where they can download the table registration form and then either scan that in an email to us or whatever so that we skip the one through ten piece and allow them to pay for the table and then send us the form of the registrations. Mm -hmm. And then you edit the names in the back end or just put them on? Yeah, yeah we usually don't do more than, than four or five registration names. Okay. You know, once yeah. you get above that then we go to a, a good price set with a bigger amount. Mm -hmm. And just say, send us your roster. One solution we've done for a client of ours is uh, we use a contribution page where they prepay for X number of registrations for this event, and we give them a discount code. And when they know who's attending, they give them the discount code. They go to the main registration page and they register themselves. Oh. Yeah, and it's already prepaid, which is a very. And then you can keep track of the count because if you're using Civi Discount, if your payment processor doesn't mess interact with it um, improperly, you can say this code only can be used seven times or ten times. Mm -hmm. And so you discount will give you a list who's used it. Too. Yeah, which and it'll put it on their uh, contact record, which is great. Thank you. So we've looked at building an extension for this, because what, so in, in those situations, do you want to be able to track who, so let's say someone buys a table of ten and then invites, you know, has these guests and you want those names, yeah. then those ten guests end up donating or doing something at the event and being able to track that chain of events, there's no current way yeah, to yeah, easily If you buy a table of 10, it counts 10 participants, right. but you but really you don't, don't know have who the connection. Has anyone had that experience yeah. or That's a, no workaround for that? Well, the other thing that we do, we can't do it for the table of 10, but if we're registering more than one participant, there are, we found there are two ways you could do that. One, you could register it all and not require them to put in a separate email address, yeah. but um, and I find it's always easier to make them put in that separate email address to make a separate contact record. Right. Because otherwise you're backtracking and trying to figure out who went in, who didn't. My, a couple of my clients, if that's what, because you want that contact information of the additional people, and then in, in a couple situations, then those people are making donations or doing things at the event, and you want to be able to track that. and and. Yeah, we have we do one where it's exactly like that, and we we use a multiple registration because it's a silent auction, and uh, when we check people out, we actually track who buys the baskets and such, right. so we can look at the uh, get their contribution history and stuff. Um, 
so we, we do want to get all those names in. Um, so yeah, there's a, you know, and as we go, please, if anyone has ideas, because um, there's, there's, there's different ways to do all this stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm really like to hear uh, more feedback. Okay, pricing. Pricing is fun. Pricing, uh, okay, well pricing is a couple. Of, if you have a simple event, you just have a price or maybe two prices, it's a single line item. You can do it right in the fees section. Um, just, you can set, it's a radio button, you can do one or two. You can set a default um, and you can select, uh, you know, counts on everything. Um, so that, that's pretty straight ahead. If you go beyond that, you need to start using price sets. And I assume everyone has, people use, have people used price sets for the most part? We use price sets a lot because what we end up with is we end up with having to gather information and not just about what they're paying for, but what they plan to do there. So for example, we'll have a conference, we'll have five breakout sessions. And we, the, the client needs to know how many people are attending each breakout session. And there's two, one is that they may have a limit of, of people in the workshop. So the room only holds 50, they have to be able to cut it off, um, which uh, you can do as part of a pricing field. The other thing is that they, need, they just need counts. So they need to know they'll have five rooms at a hotel, one holds 100, a couple hold 50, a couple are smaller, so they'll say, okay, there's five breakout sessions, all right, that's the biggest one, we're gonna have to put it in that room. Um, so basically, um, one thing I would say, if you need to count something, you really need to use it in a price set um, because it allows you to get a, an actual count on what people are. Other option is meal options. If you know, um, you want, just want to know, the pricing is all the same, but you want to know whether you're eating chicken or fish and you want to count really quickly on that. Um, and there's an extension I'll talk about later that does this. You know, you get, you know, I, I got any 55 chicken, I need, you know, 65 uh, fish and, uh, couple others. Um, so uh, um, that's when you really got to decide what you're going to put in a profile versus a price set. Uh, price sets, um, you can actually create multiple price fields. One, we have a fundraiser where people can uh, just sign up for the fundraiser, but we also give them the option to make an additional donation. Uh, and the other key thing is, uh, like I said, we have some that, um, depending on, you know, when days you're going, the pricing's different, and then the meal options become different. Um, so you really, if you're going beyond a basic fee, you really want to use a price set. Um, and price sets, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, lead me right into my, the funnest thing of all, discounts. <laughs> all right, uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a bunch about discounts. Has anyone, uh, some of you use Civi Discount? You, anyone else? It's a pretty popular extension. Um, so basically there's two type of, types of discount you come across. One is a time-based discount, which is an early bear discount. You register before the 15th, you get 10% off or something. Uh, in the basic um, fee tab where you just do a basic price field, you can actually set that and have an alternate pricing before a certain date. In price sets, you can actually set a field to expire, which can be very nice if you're charging an early, you have an early bird discount for the conference registration but the meals and everything else stays the same. So you create a price field with the early bird pricing, you have it expire on, let's say, the 15th at midnight, then you create a regular pricing field, and you have that begin at 12.01 on the 16th, or whatever, you know, and then it kicks in automatically. Which is, yep? We've got like 10 leading up to the event. Our price increases every week. I mean, you could create, if it's going week by week, you yeah. could create price fields, for, you know, for each week, and it would automatically, yeah, and expire, and that would happen automatically. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of work if you have all those. Um, you know, it's some copying and paste. One thing I would say is when you, when you create that second price field, um, when you create the line items, the selections, I always say change, do some sort of change. Because what I've noticed that if you're going back in a participant report and you're trying to filter by a price um, level, if it's the same in the early bird as the regular, it's not going to give you two selections. It doesn't always pull correctly. And I've, been I've noticed this in one we did recently. And I really haven't had time to figure it out. But I've always said use a, you know, a little like early bird pricing 
you know. And I actually encourage a lot of my clients, especially with complex price sets, is to code everything. So if the early bird it might be EB1, EB2, and then R1, R2, especially when you get into workshops, um, you know, workshop B1, B2, B3. What's great about when you code things is if you're going to do a quick, uh, you know, change criteria in a report or a custom search or, or an advanced search, you go to that fee level, you type that code, and bang, it pops right up. You don't have to scroll down through a lot of things. So coding can help uh, a lot. Um, so uh, getting those timing right, and you can, you can do it. You can do a whole bunch. Um, you just got to make sure your timing, you know. I always set them to expire. If it expires on a certain day, I say stop at 11.59 and start the next one at midnight. Um, Unless people, you think people are doing it at midnight. <laughs> and you can always change it. If you change your early bird pricing thing, you can go in and change it. Just make sure you change the other. The yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so Civi Discount. Um, Civi Discount's an extension. Uh, you can download it through its pretty, as I said earlier, it's one of the most popular extensions. Uh, now, Civi Discount is a great extension because it gives you all sorts of discount options. Um, you can discount by a percentage or a dollar amount. Uh, you can create as many you know, codes as you want. And with each code, you can limit the number of uses. Um, you can target it to specific line items. So uh, let's say it only, all right, so it, it only applies to your, you have a price set that has a two-day registration or a single-day registrations. You can say it only applies to the two-day registration. So like if you have a code, okay, it's not, it'll knock 10% off your two-day registration, but it won't apply to the other ones, uh, which is really handy. Um, and uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, you can also apply to specific events. Um, now, a couple of you have used Civi Discount. Um, uh, you can also, now we don't use this a lot because our member, our organization's members don't log in. Um, but you can if some people, if you have an organization that people have to log in or, or whatever, you can say if they're logged in, they get this discount automatically. And it depends on, the, you can even say the type of member. So if they're a you know, certain level of membership, Civi Discount will automatically apply, apply the discount. What Civi Discount does do is when you uh, apply it to an event, it puts a field up on top that uh, will show you, uh, add your discount code, hit apply, and it'll automatically change the pricing. And like we said earlier, you can apply it to, you can say 10 people get this discount. And when you go into the interface, there's a, uh, a list of the codes. It'll say, uh, you know, say 2 slash 10. And that 2, you can hyperlink on. It'll give you a report of who's used it. So if you have an organization that's using, you know, 10 of them, and they say, well, who used the discount? Because it's expired. It says it's done. But, uh, you know, I, one of my people tried to use it. And then you can say, these are the people who used it. And then they say, uh, this person is not good. You can delete the registration and and move on. So, uh, yeah. Just as a FYI, I had some. I had an issue with City Discount not playing well with the Moneris payment system, which is a Canadian payment processor. Uh, do you think it would be off zeros off? So if it was supposed to be charged five thousand dollars. They were only charged five. <laughs> so we. I, I am now making up my own discount codes for this client okay. because. They use Moneris, and it, so just do a test is all I'm saying. There are other, some other payment processors that I've seen on the forums and in issues that sometimes do not play well. So, you know, make sure you test things thoroughly. Yeah. I know um, for PayPal it works great, though. Yes, uh, I know with Authorized Net it works fine. With PayPal Pro and PayPal Standard it works fine. Um, how many people uh, use PayPal Standard or have... Okay, one thing about PayPal standard, and, and this comes up in your reporting, is if they go to PayPal and they don't pay or they don't bounce back, they get that pending from incomplete transaction status. Um, and we've had people who say, wait, they registered, they registered. And the report, their report said only pull people who are registered or pending from pay later. Those people, you know, so we actually write reports for the pending from incomplete transactions so people can say, oh, they registered, but they just, went into the PayPal, you know, we call it the black hole. <laughs> if you do PayPal Pro, you have a lot less of that, especially for memberships. Yeah, PayPal uh, Pro. People, 
especially older people will get scared when they're taken off site to do a credit card. So if you do, it's, it can be worth it. One, one organization we work with, um, they're pending from in complaint transactions have almost gone away completely when we moved to PayPal Pro. Because it's everything, it's an all in one stop. Yeah, my ones that use authorized matter of PayPal Pro rarely have that issue. Um, but the PayPal standards, I run into, uh, so you know, a lot of our organizations are umbrella organizations for uh, county-based uh, services organizations. A lot of them are government employees registering for conferences. Um, when they first, a lot, it, for some of them, it's only about 30% that will pay with a credit card. Now that's changing the government starting to, a lot of governments are starting to pay with a credit card. It's easier for them, but a lot have to pay later. There's a voucher system, and so we run into a lot of pending from pay later issues. Um, you know, and collections and other things. Uh, but that is changing and more and more people, we do have some who don't allow you to register online without a credit card because they don't wanna, they say if you don't want it, then you're gonna call the office or, or mail in the form. And, um, and that's part of your plan. You have to decide, you know, how you wanna go with that. All right, so uh, you got your registration set up and before you get going, really think about your reports. Um, back to that, what do you want to see on game day? Um, and I always create a new menu, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the navigation menu part of the administration, but do most people know how to do that? Um, if you don't, I'll show you real quick and I jump into a, a test site we have. Under administration, you can uh, customize the navigation menu. So we create a new menu called conference reports or registration reports, and under there we'll put the reports we need, and I usually create three or four reports um, depending on the needs of the client. Uh, but that way when the administrator, whoever's managing the event, and you know, sometimes it's a volunteer, sometimes it's a, you know administrator, we have one client, the CEO wants to see how many people have registered every day. <laughs> he wants a number. So we set it up, he logs in, we have a little redirect, it just opens his report. And that's the only thing he has the permission to see. He can't edit, he can't do anything, except see that report of who's coming to his, who his fundraiser. You know? And believe me, if he had to try to go any farther, he'd get lost, so it, you know. And <laughs> so we usually have a couple different reports and access based on, in some cases we actually set up some pretty you know, permission levels so only pe certain people can see certain reports. Um, so you want all those on the menu so you don't have to go hunting for them. You don't have to change criteria or anything in an existing report. You know, the participant report gives you most of what you need right out of the box. Um, but there's a, you know, there's, there's a couple other uh, things you may want. Um, and uh, has anyone used the extended report extension? Oh, okay. Uh, this extension, did you raise your hand, Kate? <laughs> um, this extension, what's great about this extension is it allows you to create what's called a line item participant report. And the best thing about it is it'll sit there, it'll pull all the line items and it can tell you how many people signed up for that in one report. So that scenario where you have workshops and you need to figure out the rooms and how many people are registered, it'll give you a nice report that shows you all that. You can actually total the pricing and everything. We use it for counting. Uh, it's an extension, you can get a link to it through the extensions directory. It's, it worked fine uh, in 4.5, um, and Eileen, who created it, is here. I was going to ask her. If, uh, I loaded it into a 4.6 site today, and it, it, it's a little, the layouts with the new reporting tabs, um, I'm not sure. It, I didn't really get a chance to test it, but I know it works fine up through 4.5. Uh, it's a very handy, it has some other reports that are, are pretty good, but this is the report that we've used this forever. And, um, it really kind of makes your life easy, especially if you're doing a lot of counts. Um, and then as you know, every report you can export um, as a PDF, you can email it, um, you can export as a CSV, so if you want to get it in Excel and mess around with it, um, you know, that's all very easy to do. A uh, quick thing that we have a lot of our clients teach, we teach them how to, uh, when you write a report, you can, uh, obviously you can change uh, criteria and filters quickly. Um, how many people have done a lot of report Editing? Not really. Okay, so um, you can change um, the new the new four six layout is great because it has tabs along the top, so you can look at the columns, filters, you know, sorting. Um, uh, what's the next? Uh, I forget the other three, but 
click quickly uh, and get that. And then the last is how you, you can save it. And there's two ways. When you change a report, you can update it, which will save it exactly the same, or you can save a copy. So let's say you, you, know, you got the main report, but you want to put different fields. You want it to look different. You can save a copy, make it your report, and uh, it's quick and easy. So we teach a lot of our end users to do that right off the bat. What about creating charts or graphs? Or uh, our, our class really don't ask for it. <laughs> like I said, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your answer, yeah. but I just wanted to plug a small uh, two extensions actually for exporting to Excel, which uh, most of my clients find kind of frustrating yeah. to import in uh, Excel itself. It works in the block list, but there's one which uh, exports to a CSV format that's more Excel friendly. Yeah. And there's another more, slightly more experimental, so it might be a bit more buggy, mm -hmm. which exports to the native Excel format. So there's really uh -huh. no risk of opening Excel. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I do a lot of, ex I'd like to see what, because I do a lot of exporting to Excel. Um, primarily because I just, I like to get in, filter, and if I get the basic information, I uh, mess with. I also have clients who are just more comfortable in Excel. They say, just get me the info here, and I'll, I'll put it the way I want. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the export to Excel option is, is, is great. Um, the PD, one thing, another thing I've noticed about the PDF, if you have a pretty large like participant report that has a lot of detail, and we're talking, you know, the one I'm thinking of had about six or seven hundred registrants, um, and this is probably a server issue, uh, but they tried to export it to PDF, and it just hung. I mean, just it just it overloaded. Again, that's probably a RAM issue that's allocated to the to Civi when it's doing that PDF thing. If it's compiling a lot of stuff, it uses some resources, so um, I know I've heard other people have issues when they're writing a lot of letters and exporting PDF. You yeah. can use the WebKit to HTML option if your server supports it. Uh -huh. It uses a different rendering uh, option and it's, it can yeah. be more efficient. All right. I, I use mostly, like I said, mostly use Excel, so I don't do that a lot, but I did know a client had that issue. And, so going back to the data visualization, though, is there capability, even though you don't necessarily use it with your clients, yep. is there a capability to insert graphs and charts and things like that? Or is it a matter of putting in Excel and making charts and graphs out of Excel? Uh, there's a workshop coming up right after this on yeah. data insights and Sydney visual as recording workshop. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. Yeah, I mean, I... Oh, go ahead. I, I have not explored that, so I'm um, just thinking right off the bat. But you know, those things are always going on. So there was a Google Summer of Code project last year called City Visualize. Yeah, it's an extension for that, and okay. it works natively with events. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know how many, how extensive the, yeah. the reporting goes on that, but I played with it, and the initial mm -hmm. test okay. case was pretty effective. Yeah. Yeah, and it was presented in London. Last okay. September, so you have the video on the. Oh, website. great. Oh, right. it was Thank fantastic. You. It was about European elections. This was just fantastic. It's, and like I said, that my clients aren't asking for it. Um, so we just, it's one of those things that's on the list of <laughs> things that now I know more, so I'll go check it out. You got a question? Yeah, so I need better reporting on the event turnout profile, you know, the time, because our organization doesn't really like register people or take money or things like that. What we're trying to do is to turn out our base to come to our events. Okay. So right now I don't see a way to be able to make a report to see here's all the people who said that they're coming, you know, so their their participant status for every one of them is targeted because okay. we haven't had the event yet. Yeah, sure. But we're doing callbacks and so some of them have said yes and some of them said no and then there's even yeah. a different profile for figuring out who needs a ride and childcare. But I don't really see any way to make a report on the event <coughs> profile or the invite team responses. So they're all their status is targeted. Yeah, they're all their status is targeted. And then when you when they go, do you change their status? Right, but but in planning for the event, we need to know like who's who's everybody who said yes, so that we could you know well, so you that can, we could do yeah. uh, just a report. I mean, we can do we can do it by guess to send a like an email invite, right? But we need to know like with our calls and our phone banking, yep. how many people said no, how many people said yes, how many were that phone numbers, and okay. there's no way to generate a report from the event turnout profile? Well, from the, I mean, if you have a participant report, mm -hmm. you can filter by status okay. and pull, like let's see, say all the people say yes, that'll give you a list of just those people whose status is but yes. That's different than the participant role of like targeted, registered, attended. Oh, so you're uh, 
your uh, your participant role, like attendee speaker. Right. Well, there's that attendee speaker yeah. thing, but then there's also like targeted, attended, no show, all of those. Yeah, the, that's the status. Right. So yeah. none of those change when we're calling just to turn out people for events, like okay. to for them to come and the yeah. event pro turnout profile where you call people three times mm -hmm. to try to get them to turn out or the details on like child care and okay. the ride. Yeah. How do you generate reports from those particular profiles? Well, are those, because you could, you can, you know, you can change those status lists. You can add different statuses, obviously. Um, you can also, if you are doing something, I mean, you can create a custom field and filter by that because you can make, if you make a custom field searchable, mm -hmm. it'll show up, and it's for a participant. Mm -hmm. It'll show up, it'll be in a different box in the filter, but you'll be able to filter by custom fields, which uh, I, I, we could probably talk afterwards okay. and I could see a little more of the scenario you're looking at, but there's probably a couple ways to do it. Right. Yeah. Why are you tracking things like that for activities? Because we're using events. We're using the event turnout profile that's in there that pulls up everybody who we have targeted for this event, yeah. and then it gives you the phone number and the three attempts and what happened last time if you left a message or or, every, or if it's a bad phone number or something like that. So we're using that profile to try and turn out people to come to the event rather than having it as an activity. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Let's catch up later. I, I, I have to see a little more of how, how okay. you're doing it. Um, Okay, uh, so you've got your reports, you've got your registration, everything's all thing, and what was brought up earlier is testing. <laughs> and this is where, <clears throat> I'll be honest, this, my clients, you send, like, when's it, you send them the thing, you say, please go through it, to, and they don't tell, you brought up test. You, you gotta test. I, when I set a new one up, I test it probably 20, 30 times. I mean, I got an inbox, I got, I use six or seven different emails, addresses, I'm, killing registrations right and left because I'll get it through, the email won't have the wording they'll want, I go and I change it. Uh, you know, so I'll run 20 or 30, t on a new, new system that hasn't been used yet, I'll run 20 or 30 tests and, and I'll try to do everything I can possibly think of to break it or not get the right information. And it never fails, I miss something, as, as everyone knows. You know. So I, I do a bunch of tests and I send it to the client and I have them proofread everything and all this, and uh, have them run tests, or I ask them to run tests. And then I actually ask them, like, do you have a group of people who can run tests? And a lot of times, do you have a group that, you know, who, who are a couple, a lot of cases, a couple board members or staff, who are going to the event, and they're gonna register, have them go register with the credit card, so you know that it goes through, and everything goes through the way you want it, you know? Um, that's one, I mean, but you gotta get those end users testing because something's going to come up. Uh, and then as you do the test, go through your reports and make sure you're getting things the way you want them. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple uh, nightmare things that have happened to me. Uh, we had one recently that it was a big conference. There were four different workshops over two days. It was uh, needed for CEU uh, continuing education credits. And then we came through, we got to the end of the thing. We had to go through and do a merge to print out certificates for the uh, attendees and on the certificate form there's a field that says uh, license number uh, and I look at that and I go we never collected that the client never mentioned it and then I went back through all the paperwork the client never mentioned it I didn't think of it I went back to the client and said you know we don't have that information and they, they realize now <laughs> since then they've put it all in but they realized that um, you know they needed that information there was another one where we got in and it was there was a pre-morning, it was a, actually a yoga workshop, but it could only hold 50 people, so they needed to know who was gonna plan to attend. Um, of course, they realized that after registration had been open for uh, about three weeks. Uh, so we got, you got mixed numbers. So really go back and, 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 and try to think about that. The biggest thing is that something like if you need a required field, and because if you, if you realize it halfway and you got 100 people registered, that's when uh, the headaches start. <laughs> um, you know, you have to, to go back and, and figure it out. Um, so uh, I, I, I always say test, test, test again. And again, if this is something that's like an annual event that uh, a client does every year or every, the first time through is, is always the hardest because you're gonna figure out all the things that are going on. Um, so everything's tested, you're ready, you're going live. So obviously you wanna get your word out, you wanna blast email. Um, we tend to use CiviMail. Uh, we use a, 
We'll have a situation we take all the attendees from last year's event, send them all, or the last couple of years, all the members, we put them in a big group, we blast it out uh, with links. Um, uh, a lot of our clients will use social media um, and talk it up. You know, everything, a lot of our clients put registration links right on the bottom of their email signatures when they have an event coming up. Most of them, it's the, it's the biggest event of the year. Um, direct all the traffic to the website and make the event easy to find on the website. Um, I was in the Joomla workshop yesterday and there was a little, um, what was it called? It was a little, uh, it drops the upcoming events right in a little uh, box on the side like it would, yeah. And I thought that was great, you know, because it puts it right there on the front. But, you know, if people go to your, it's very hard for people if you put something like, you know, joesgarage.org slash registration event. Those links are hard to figure out. If they just go right to the website and right there on the front page is register now, or um, it, it, it gets, you, gets them to where they want to be quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then as people are starting to register, and a lot of people do this, get in there, monitor your reports and all that. Make sure the information is going in the way you want it. Um, you know, constantly review. Keep, you know, keep an eye on the things. Uh, and make sure, uh, you know, a lot of cases we have uh, an administrator looking at it. We also have an accountant looking at it. Because the accountant's getting that credit card reconciliation. And you may have all the information in Civi, and it's all the way you want to be. But when they go back and look at the statement, they want to make sure all that stuff's looking right. So make sure they have the tools to do all that. Um, and then when the event's done, I always tell people, because I see these people, they've been at the hotel all day, all, you know, 12 hours a day. It's a big thing. Keeping a smile on their face, even though no matter what's happening. Um, we always schedule a post-event meeting. Um, I always say, just relax. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> You're done. Go home. Take a nap. Uh, yeah. For walk-ins, how do you, how do you kind of, because they're not, they're not an attendee, or, or they are an attendee. Yep. Do you need to create another type of tag for them, or if you, uh, you want to have a report where you can see how many attendees you have or walk-ins? Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can just enter them, and you can run a report based on the entry date. So if you're registering after the fact, you put the date in after the event. You know, you put a date range in, and that's right in the report filters. And that'll tell you the people that registered after, you, you put in afterwards, or the date you did it. You could create a, a tag or a, a checkbox. You, you can um, create fields that are admin only in price sets. So for example, uh, one of the discounts I meant to talk about was, let's say that special discount you have, you're given a comp thing or something, you don't want anyone to see it. You can put a field that's value is minus one, and you put that in the price set, and you make it admin only. When you're in the back end, you go to that field, it'll show up in the registration. Let's say their total is 100, you could put 100 you know, in there. You do a similar thing with walk-in, where it's just a checkbox or something. And you know, you, when you're registering them, you check them as walk-in. That way you could filter it faster. Um, you can do that in the price. You can do it as a custom field, too. Either way. Yeah, you could do it. Um, you know, if you do it as a participant status, um, just remember if you're trying to get everybody, to, if you're filtering by status, you want to make sure you have that status included. Um, so, uh, post event meeting is really getting down what, what, what went well, what didn't went well, you know, what didn't go well, um, and how you need to change. And I would say, you know, do this, don't give it a little time, but don't wait six months till you're ramping up to the next event. You know, take the notes afterwards and, and try to address the stuff then so when you ramp up for the next and you're preparing, you know, you know the stuff that you really need to uh, get together. Um, wrap up data, the walk-ins um, we just talked. Now some people will register walk-ins right at the site. Um, you know, that's, you can have a couple people with laptops. Um, I was talking to the, the payment guy downstairs. They actually have a USB card reader that works right through Civi. Um, it's encrypted and everything, which is, is pretty cool. Um, and you can in Civi, if you're using, you can register someone with a credit card by clicking a button. Has everyone seen that? It's a pretty cool feature. If you're, you put someone in, you want to register from an event, on the events tab of their contact summary, there's a say register with credit card. You can do this with contributions too. Uh, you click it, it brings up, you put in their card information, it processes it through your credit card processor and puts you info right in. Um, so that's... Uh, that's another way you can register people on site or over the phone. Yeah. You know how in Eventbrite you can check people in easily, like on a on a phone or on a tablet. Is there a way yeah. to do that? 
Um, I haven't. I know that when you print name badges through Civi, it'll put a barcode on it. Does anyone use that? <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I had someone ask me. It's one of those things I'm starting to look at. Because, uh, yeah. I only did a bit of research. I haven't really tested it. But those barcodes you can scan, and it it works as a USB keyboard. So it just okay. prints, a, you know, scans your barcode and inputs a thing that you can then use for a search, for example. Okay. In your event, confirming yeah. purpose. The Filipino Worker Center in LA uses CDCR and barcodes IDs. So they print out a machine, they take a picture, and it has a barcode, and that's how people get scanned in the device. We so have one that's. Uh, talk to somebody who actually uses it. We had one recently that. They had to track, it was the one that had the continuing education, they had to track the uh, attendance of each workshop. And we're actually, they want a solution like that, a barcode. So that's one thing that's on my list over the next, they don't do it again until next year, but something that um, is a neat feature. And I have noticed that some of the other uh, bigger, pretty event-based softwares are starting to do. So um, you, can, you can generate name badges in Civi. Um, you can actually edit. You know what? There's a couple different templates in there. What it does is it creates a PDF that you can print. Um, issues if you want to edit anybody or do anything outside it. Um, it's not like a word merge where you can merge the whole thing and go through and and check things. Um, but it's 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 pretty good. It, it it only has a couple layouts. So if you have a special layout, you want to export and and do a traditional merge. But uh, that's a uh, you know, and it does have that that barcode thing, which is like I said on my list of exploration. Could it, could it print the name badge if they were assigned to a table? Would it, would it, does it have a capability to do something like that? Like if somebody bought a table and had yeah. a table, it, it will do that? You, you, you can add what, whatever fields you want so you can, to the badge itself, and you can tell it where to put it. Um, it it's pretty good. It's right, in the, it's right in the interface, and you can, you can say whether to align it middle. You can tell what font to use, middle, left, right. Um, you can assign, if you had that data in a, in a custom field, um, you could put it right in. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the event of uh, like a silent auction or something, yes. will it auto-generate bidder numbers? Or how do you get bidder numbers if it's, a silent, if it's an auction? Well, I'm sure. Uh, the participant ID. The that's, ID? Okay. Yeah. that's what I do. That's probably the easiest thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's great because all your reports will drop that right in. What I do is um, I take the Greek letters of their authority and their participant ID, and we print it upside down on their name tags. So they can just look down at what uh. the fifth is to write it. Ah. Down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's neat trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, attendance, attendance is whether you want you want to go through and change people whether they attended or not. Some organizations do this. Some people, it's you need like some you said who attended, who didn't. Um, you can probably do that through the batch update through profile. If you're doing long lists, I know we've done that with some custom fields. Has some of you use that? I saw some people nod their heads. Um, that's a great thing that Civi has. You can basically create a profile with the fields you want, and you do a search and you say select all and batch update by profile. It lists all the people, and then you have all the fields down. You can check them off and it does them all, um, which is a neat tool. Uh, and collections, uh, you want to collect the money. <laughs> uh, we do a couple things with collections. Um, you know, we do have mailer reminders. Um, you know, we'll create a, a smart group that says who still owes money, um, so they can quickly be, you know, sent reminders. Uh, one thing I was going to talk about quickly was a scheduled reminder. Does anyone use that feature? It's a great feature. Um, you can tell it to send everybody a, a e this email two weeks before the event. Uh, one feature we've used it for is a lot of people put their conference materials online. Please go to our website, or we even include a QR code. Go to the website, you know, get your materials ahead of time so we don't have to print them out. Um, you can set it by a couple different, you know, you know, time parameters. Uh, just make sure you got the cron running, or else it won't go. <laughs> um, cron. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Civi has a whole bunch of what they call scheduled jobs, um, and they're geared to run, but if you don't have a, a cron job set up to run them on your server, they don't go. You can manually run them. Um, for example, Civi Mail runs, if you don't have the cron job run when you send out a mailing, it's just going to sit there as not sent. Uh, you can go and under administrator, 
with the system, scheduled jobs, and you can manually run the jobs, but if you're doing anything like scheduled reminders, you need to kind of run it, have it run on a, uh, yeah, membership status, uh, clearing the cache, there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, and you can set up just a uh, cron job that'll run everything. Um, or you can specify which ones to run and when to run them. Uh, and uh, I said create a time um, for any changes and uh, don't wait till next time. <laughs> uh, all right, I want to um, throw out a scenario that we had to deal with a, uh, about six months ago um, and how we, how we took care of it. Um, this was a workshop for correctional officers and county sheriffs um, dealing with uh, mental health issues inside the correctional system. It was run by the New York State Office of Mental Health through a nonprofit, um, and it was funded by a grant through the New York State Office of Mental Health. So it was primarily a free event for the people who were, quote unquote, invited. So every county had uh, a certain allocation of people who could attend. Some of the scholarships included a hotel stay. So that was one value we had. Some included um, just the conference, because they were local to where the conference was. And each county, like I said, had different. It wasn't everybody had five. Some counties had 10, some counties had three. Um, so they were allocated depending on the region. They also had a, wanted a wait list of those interested but didn't have a county allocation or hadn't gotten a scholarship, because what was happening is they had extras that they wanted to hand out, but they wanted to see who was coming first. And the last part is they did have a paid registration, but the paid registration folks who were just coming to think, we didn't want any knowledge of the scholarships or anything was available. Um, so we it had to be a little, it was kind of a totally different pricing scenario, everything was different. Uh, so what we did was um, we created an event, the event for the scholarships. We created codes for every county and their parameters. Uh, there's 62 counties in the state of New York. Um, we actually did it through a, we did it right in the MySQL backend and import. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not hard to do if you understand how the layout of the table is. It's actually pretty easy. Um, but, you know, it, it took, once we built the spreadsheet, it took, the biggest issue here when we talk about planning is that the parameters kept changing. Um, as with any government entity, they change their mind. <laughs> so, uh, so we did it as an import, so every county had so many scholarships. If they registered, depending on the line item, so if they were needed a hotel, that value went to zero. We actually eventually put a little jQuery thing so they didn't even see the other value. It just got selected at zero, so it automatically set them up. They signed up for the workshops. Went smoothly, we had a list of extras, uh, so we had a special code for the extra people. When we, when we said, you're approved, we handed them a, a special code. Um, and it was nice because in Civi Discount, we could see who registered, so when a county uh, administrator calls, you can say, these are the people you got. I said, okay, yeah, I got three more, or this person's not coming, you can release the, the code. So that worked great. The wait list we did actually very simply. We just created a little oh, event yeah. that just signed up. So people could just sign up. There was no cost. It was just it just created a list um, because we really wanted to get them in the system, and we couldn't use the civi waitlist system because we weren't maxing out um, the number of attendees. So, but that was we just really got name, county, and email. It was, it was average. The paid registrations. They didn't want anybody to see anything, so we didn't want that little code field up top and all that, and that pricing scenario the same. So, I, I, I'm. Trying to figure out if, if someone hears this and says I, there was a better way to do it, please let me know. But we created a, a similar event that was just for paid attendees. Um, I used a different price set. Um, while the, the workshop fields and everything were the same, the pricing was different. And what was nice about it is with Civi, we actually created consolidated reports. So we could get attendee lists for the, the multiple events because you can do that in Civi and say, show me participants for these two which worked out well for our uh, administrators. One of the issues here is that there was a lot of internal control over what was going on. Um, and as I said, a lot of changes. So we'd set it up one way and they'd come along and they'd change it to a different way. Um, at one point they had 36 breakout sessions that they wanted registrations for and we said, Are you, that's gonna be forever. We actually turned it into a track system if you're on which track you're on, limited your selection in each breakout to three. Um, then they changed and went back. We only have five breakouts. <laughs> so it was a, 
lot. Um, and we used a, we had meal choices and, and custom fields. Um, so it, it was a great, the, the part I liked about this, most challenging, the most fun, was really the scholarships for each county and using Civi Discount. It just really shows you how flexible a tool it, it can be um, to uh, you know, really uh, you know, get things like that, where you really need to have custom discount codes for various people. So uh, that was the thing I did. Um, like I said, most of this was about planning and using the tools the best way possible. Um, but you can customize it. Sometimes you're not going to get the answer you want. Um, I don't have a lot of time. So uh, has anyone customized templates and stuff in Civi? Yeah. Um, it's, very, it's, it's not as hard as you think. But if you're going to do it, you really need to use this uh, custom template directory. And inside the directory, you mirror to the template. So you want to find out what template a page is using. You can just view source, and you'll see something along these lines. Uh, template file invoked, and, and this will be inside. And that's the path you want to mirror in your custom and fields uh, custom template directory. Um, so you'll, you'll see, and then that's to, if you move that template and re put the same name in that custom template directory, any changes you make will overwrite the existing template. Uh, which is, if you're taking sections out, you're doing that, that's fine. The other thing you can do is if you're just, a lot of times we'll throw a little jQuery snippet in that just changes some of the display, depending on um, a lot of times if they select like a certain price thing, they'll change the meal um, selections, just hide certain things or show certain things. Uh, and if you use the template name, like this one's register.tpl, you use .extra, then .tpl, it just adds that one little piece to the template, which is very handy um, to make a quick change. Um, and uh, the key also there is if you're using the multiple registration, the additional participants use a just different template. So make sure you, you do that. What's nice here is when you upgrade, your changes don't get overwritten. And that's similar with... Uh, <coughs> If you do custom CSS stuff, um, where your layout comes in, you don't like the way the way the form's laying out fields, you can uh, add some custom custom CSS file, which will add, either add to the existing CSS, or if you want to write a whole new file, it'll you can check a box to overwrite. Um, so if you want to get into that sort of thing, so uh, I think I'm out of time. <laughs> I kept going through this thing saying, do I have enough or do I have too much? And, um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I'll be honest, the reporting doesn't, isn't always perfect. <laughs> now, most of my clients are, are OK with it being a little, but it's not the best. It's doable. And like I said, most of this was about what you can do with, you know, out of the box. Um, but, you know, it, it's a good event system, but, it, you know, it, there's, that's a great thing if we, you know, something like that. Um, so, any other questions? OK. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your day.